So welcome everybody out there. That Welcome to Jack's Magic today, uh, the training sponsored by Space Coast Pool School, a uh, monthly training I've been trying to sponsor so that we can get some great education out to our industry. So that's my goal. And that's why I have Joel Gray here today. Um, Space Coast Pool School. I am a provider for the certified pool operator course. I do in-person. I offer in-person classes anywhere in Florida and private classes in person as well. And I also teach the 100% virtual certified pool operator CPO course. There's my website, spacecoastpoolschool.com, or you can contact me, the instructor, Lauren Broom, at 321-726-8509 if you have any questions about class. Other than that, our main presenter today is Joel Gray with Jax Magic. And he's going to be doing a presentation today on stain identification and how to treat pool stains. Thank you very much for being here today, Joel. How are you? I'm doing well, Lauren. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. No problem. It, I'm glad to have you here today. I interviewed you on my podcast last month and we talked about uh, stains and your products and lots of things already. Uh, this will be nice for everybody to visually see um, what we talked about on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to get a little bit more in depth today. Yep. So I just allowed, I got off sharing my screen. So you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. So walk me ahead, hit share screen. Yep. Hit share screen. And uh, help me out here, Lauren. I got the blue box where it says screen. Yep. Up there. What's the blue button in the bottom right hand corner say? Share. Okay. Whoops. Yep. There we go. All right. And I need to bring up that presentation, correct? Yes, you do. Okay. Sorry about this. I'm not, I'm trying to minimize it. <laughs> okay. Hold on. We will get there. All right. Don't know why my video is showing up right here. You got move my video over. There you go. I'm gone now. Oh, well, now I'm still showing up. You got to move me off to the side. There we go. Now I'm gone. All right. All right. So let's get started, right? Yes. So we're going to talk today about uh, staining, scaling, discoloration uh, in swimming pools, uh, the identification of it, prevention and removal. Uh, you know, you're gonna, we're going to give you uh, some knowledge about why these occur and how to prevent them from coming back. So, you know, Jack, uh, who's the founder of Jack's Magic, always says uh, that all pools at some point will stain. There are those pools that uh, are stained and those pools, those pools that are going to stain. So we need to figure out why these occur, what happens. And our whole process at Jack's Magic uh, for removal is an in-water treatment where you don't have to drain the pool and the process of removing the metal stains uh, from the plaster or the vinyl or the fiberglass or whatever the pool surface is, is a non-aggressive approach. It's not a drain and acid wash where you're literally, you know, getting into the finish of the pool with acid. Um, you know, with a plaster pool, you can actually start to delaminate the finish when you acid wash. And our process is usually a lot more effective because it involves circulating the product uh, in the water. So it's a, uh, the contact time is much longer. And we'll get into that here. So, uh, you know, if you're not sure what you're seeing or what to do, give us a call. We're always here to help. Uh, we're located in Pinellas County, Florida. The phone number there is 727-536-4500. You can email us at jacksmagic at jacksmagic.com. Um, and there's also a website form you can fill out jacksmagic.com forward slash contact. And, you know, when you call us, you get a live voice here in Florida. Uh, at Jack's Magic, not somebody overseas that may not know what's going on with the swimming pool. So um, module one is going to be the basics, some basics for you to consider uh, for every pool that comes your way before you commit to them. Uh, our goal and benefit here, our goal is, is really, and your benefit is to learn and understand different water balance scenarios that are the catalyst for staining in swimming pools and spas. Unbalanced water can really be a catalyst for staining. I'm uh, going to learn to understand the general characteristics and differences between organic and inorganic stains, the difference between algae possibly and a metal stain. And uh, we'll give you an understanding about how to be proactive versus reactive in doing preventive maintenance uh, for staining. 
And this will really set you apart from the, other, the rest of the industry that's not doing it. You know, most pool owners define the well-being of their pool and how the water looks. Is it clear? Is it free from algae? Is it free from stains? Uh, a properly maintained pool is going to be an ongoing source of satisfaction and enjoyment. Everybody loves a beautiful, sparkling blue pool. And really, pool owners are depending on your uh, professional advice to help them keep their pools operating correctly and looking their best. You are the service professional. So evaluating a pool, you know, before you commit to working on a pool, you should always evaluate the pool in person, go out there, take a look, you know, see what's going on. It may not be a pool that you want to inherit. Um, evaluate the property owner as well. <laughs> uh, you know, you're going to have a relationship with this person and they're going to have to be committed to making the pool right with you. And, you know, not every uh, customer business owner relationship is a good one. So you want to try to evaluate the uh, potential customer before uh, taking them on as a client. Uh, a pool is an ever-changing environment, so you really need to control what you can. Um, stains and discolorations come from a variety of sources in many forms, most of which you have no control over. There's a misunderstanding that you really have control over this, and you really don't. I mean, metals can come from water sources, um, pool equipment. You know, you may have corrosive water, uh, uh, in the swimming pool that gets into gas heaters, brass gate valves, heat exchangers, copper plumbing, mineral systems can inject metals into pools. Uh, pool chemicals, a lot of times you have iron and muriatic acid, copper and algicides, some of the salts have iron in them. Airborne contaminants uh, from plants, construction, highways, ponds, lakes, fertilizer, uh, all these things can contribute to staining in the pool. Um, what you can control is uh, everything that you do should be based on properly balanced water. It's really your best friend. Unbalanced water can be a catalyst for staining and scaling, but look, even with perfectly balanced water, a pool can stain. But if it's unbalanced, it can happen a whole lot quicker and easier. Uh, water balance parameters really determine the well being of the pool. Um, the key factors here being pH, uh, total alkalinity, calcium hardness stabilizer or cyanuric acid, free chlorine and total chlorine. You guys really need to test for both. Um, there is no test that I'm aware of for combined chlorine in our industry and the difference between free chlorine and total chlorine is combined chlorine. Um, you never want that difference between free chlorine and total chlorine to be more than a half part per million um, because that indicates there's a lot of combined chlorine in the water, which is really just inactive sanitizer uh, sitting there and not doing anything to prevent the growth of algae and uh, crypto and waterborne viruses and things that, you know, chlorine is in there for. Um, those factors we just went over, those uh, chemistry ranges can also contribute to water being corrosive, neutral, or scale forming. Uh, and if you don't, whoops, if you don't address organic contaminants in the pool, uh, it'll lead to a greater consumption of chlorine and shorter filter runs. So these are things that you can control. Um, Ecosystems, pool spas, fountains, etc., are ecosystems just like aquariums, terrariums, uh, unlike the above environments, but what goes into recreational water is largely uncontrolled. Uh, pollen, dust, user-borne contaminants, chemical impurities. Keep in mind that everything you add for treatment will affect other factors in the water and materials used in the feature. So ecosystem contaminants, you know, pets and animals, swimming suits, pool gear, <laughs> Uh, you know, we can carry contaminants into the water involuntarily with body waste, spores, bacteria. Uh, swimming suits can have, uh, you know, soap on them. If they're used on a lake, uh, they can carry algae and fungus in. Uh, pool gear, brushes, nets, uh, other things used in the pool can carry in algae if not uh, thoroughly cleaned. You know, one example is with pink algae. If you put a brush or a net in a pool with pink algae and you don't thoroughly clean it with chlorine, uh, before putting it in the next pool, you could bring that pink algae is very contagious. You could bring that into the next swimming pool. You put the, uh, the brush or the net in. So you need to be careful of that. Um, examples of side effects, you know, you shock with Cal Hypo or sodium hypochlorite, liquid chlorine. It's going to raise your TDS. It's going to raise your pH. Um, and really dramatically where it's first applied to the water. This is sometimes you'll hear about people pouring liquid chlorine in a pool and getting a cloud because the pH of liquid chlorine is 13. So um, it's, it's raising the pH dramatically. Pre-dissolving chemicals certainly helps minimize the extremes until the products have been distributed evenly throughout the pool. If you use dichlor, 
Uh, it adds cyanuric acid to the water, trichlor as well. And there's just an example there about uh, how much dichlor will add uh, in cyanuric acid to a pool. And cy uh, cy uh, excuse me, trichlor will do the same thing. Negative side effects, uh, staining, filter clogging, deposits or damage to the surfaces in a pool environment, they're really often the results of not taking the ecosystem concept into account. Lauren, you still with me? Yes, I am. Okay, I just want to make sure because I can't see you. I'm like, I hope she's still, I hope I'm still connected. Okay. I am still here. <laughs> All right, I'll call you out every once in a while here. Um, circulation system, uh, you know, with variable speed pumps, uh, electricity can be the cheapest chemical that you use. Uh, it's important to calculate and maintain the proper filtration run times. You really should be cycling the water through the pump and filter once every six hours. So, you know, minimum you want to run a pump six hours a day, minimum. Um, shutting off the pump has the same effect as shutting off a person's heart. I mean, the pump is the circulation system for the pool. So circulation is, is usually one of your best friends along with balanced water. And the variable speed pumps nowadays, the, the you know, electric costs are a tenth of what they were uh, back in the day when we had the standard motors with copper windings. These variable speed pumps are magnet driven. But if you stop circulation, you know, waste removal stops, distribution of uh, treatment chemicals stops, temperature layering occurs where you'll get warmer water at the top, cooler water at the bottom. Uh, the chemical levels will vary greatly through the body of water until the circulation resumes. Uh, circulation of particulates and debris stops and they can settle on surfaces due to gravity. It can lead to staining and algae. So circulation is a, a really important. Uh, dead spots in the pool mean that not every gallon of water is necessarily filtered uh, even during one turnover. So we really try to minimize those dead spots by utilizing the returns the best we can, the pool returns, bringing water back into the pool. Um, even with unrestricted flow, uh, good circulation can be inhibited by the shape of the pool. Uh, that looks like the hard rock pool, maybe in, uh, in Florida there on, on the one in the shape of the guitar. Uh, caves, uneven surfaces, unique features or shapes. Uh, you got a Texas shaped pool there. That's certainly, that's, uh, that's a unique one. That's pretty cool. Is that like a lazy river or something? That's, that sure looks like it. Yeah. Yep. Because you can see seating around it and inside. So look at that one that looked like a violin. Yeah, that may be a hard rock pool. I'm not sure. You know, the hard rock does the, the musical instruments on the building sometimes. Yeah. And then they turn that little spa into the thing that you would put your chin on when you play the violin or viola. That's right. cool. <laughs> they come up with some cool things for pools, don't they? Oh, yeah, very. Um, even with unrestricted flow, good circulation can be inhibited uh, by, you know, too few or poorly positioned returns. We talked about that. Debris can settle to surfaces and corners, which really prevent their filtration. Uh, maintenance chemicals don't reach all areas of the pool. Algae staining, surface dissolution, uh, print pigment damage, et cetera, can occur. It's really important to evaluate the return positions that are ideal for pool circulation. The pool returns are really going to help you circulate water in the pool, and they should be positioned to provide displacement of the water in those low circulation areas. Of course, if you brush on a regular basis, if you use an automatic cleaner, that's a big help because they're like moving main drains, uh, the suction type cleaners, even the pressure cleaners that move around the pool, um, they're, they're really helping increase circulation in the water. And we talked about brushing. Um, you want to identify the areas of the pool where pool circulation are, uh, note them for others servicing the pool. Uh, you could drop small scoops of bicarb around the perimeter of the surface or use drops of phenol red. Uh, I probably prefer that because phenol red is not going to change. That's the uh, reagent that we use to test uh, pH. That's not going to um, affect the chemistry in the water. And that'll give you a good idea of if you have good or bad circulation in certain spots. Okay, I think we understand that. So we're gonna skip over module two. And so I'm gonna hit escape here. Okay. And we're gonna forward up to, just bear with me. Whoops. Yeah. So we'll go back into slideshow here. Go to, from current slide. Nope, go over current slide. Nope, you had it. No, no, no. From right there. Okay. There you so go. We're gonna, yep. Thank you, Lauren. Um, don't go anywhere because I, 
I can't, I can't do this without you. There you are. Okay. I'm not um, going, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> All right. So water testing is really the key to everything you'll do. And uh, why do you test the water before diagnosing or performing a treatment? Um, really in order to solve existing problems or prevent future problems, we need accurate readings and testing methods. Uh, you know, you need to store reagents in a cool place, keeping them in the back of the truck in the sunlight is not a good idea. Uh, extreme heat, exposure, too much exposure to outside air, humidity really can destroy reagents. They should be kept uh, capped when not in use and keep your reagents fresh. You know, for a pool service guy out there in the field, you know, every couple of months, we really should be recycling uh, or, you know, repurchasing uh, our reagents. Um, high chlorine residuals can definitely skew other test parameters. If you have high chlorine, it can really affect pH and alkalinity samples. So you can dechlor your sample with a little bit of um, uh, so a chlorine neutralizer, which is sodium thiosulfate. We sell it in little crystals. We sell it under the name, um, oh, it's escaping me, uh, Aftershock. But uh, there's lots of brands out there and one little crystal will dechlorinate a sample of water very, very quickly. Uh, it's important that you read manuals to learn the limits of each piece of test equipment you use. Uh, all this equipment has operational ranges. You know, one example is stabilizer. If you're testing with reagents and your stabilizer reads 100, that really could be a lot higher and you need to do dilutions on your sample to figure out where the stabilizer reading is. So for instance, when I test stabilizer and it reads 100, uh, I take my sample, I throw it out, and then I put in half pool water and half tap water which has no stabilizer. And at that point, if I get the reading under 100, let's say of 70, I know I'm really at 140 in the pool. So sometimes pools that have been on trichlor tabs or dichlor for years will have stabilizer levels 300, 400 higher. And um, that can be challenging when it comes to doing a stain test or stain in water stain treatment. Um, some equipment tests total hardness, not calcium hardness. You need to know the difference. Uh, total hardness usually recommends uh, represents calcium and magnesium in the water, whereas calcium hardness is the one that we want to use for stain testing. Uh, test the source water. Um, you really should know the makeup uh, of the source water. Uh, most of it, if it's municipal water, will contain chlorine, free and total. The proportion may vary. Uh, this could dictate superchlorination because you may have a lot of uh, combined chlorine in the water and in a good way in a municipal water system. Uh, they're combining chlorine. It's not like the combined chlorine we end up with in, with in the swimming pool, but um, you do want to hit breakpoint chlorination to free that up so your chlorine is active and available as a sanitizing uh, agent uh, in, the, in the pool. Uh, high levels of total available chlorine in whatever proportion can lead to inaccurate test results. That's why we test for total chlorine. Uh, if so, you may need to dechlorinate your test samples. We talked about that. Um, the Langelier saturation index, this is really uh, important because it measures uh, the corrosiveness, neutrality, or scaling ability of the water. And the factors taken into account are temperature, but in a very, very minor way, uh, and TDS. But the real important variables in the saturation index are pH, alkalinity, and calcium. Stabilizer or cyanuric acid also weighs in. Um, but if stabilizer is within normal ranges and TDS is under 5,000, um, the, the th key things to concentrate on are alkalinity, calcium, and pH. Um, water by nature wants to be neutral and balanced, uh, so it can be scale uh, forming uh, or, or cause staining when unwanted byproducts of this reaction. So knowing where you're at on the index is very important. Um, knowing the source of the issue means you can try to prevent it from happening right from the start. An example, bad well water, you know, using an inline filter, or different source water can help. I know here in Florida, well water contains tons of iron uh, leaching from planters that might be hanging over the pool. You can get a lot, a lot of iron in the water that way. Uh, reinforced liners, move plants, don't allow spillovers if you can from a planter into the pool. Uh, and then into module five, we're gonna talk about balancing water and how to evaluate whether pool water is properly balanced. So here you have a lot of the factors we've talked about. Um, these are good preventive maintenance parameters for uh, if you want to prevent staining and scaling in swimming pools or prevent aggressive water from you know drawing calcium out of a plaster finish or copper out of a gas heater heat exchanger. 
these are good ranges to keep a pool in. You can see free chlorine and total chlorine, you know, both at one to three parts per million, uh, pH 72 to 76, alkalinity 80 to 120, calcium between 200 and 400, uh, stabilizer 40 to 70 parts per million. There's been a lot written about stabilizer recently and a good uh, formula on stabilizer is what's called Falk's ratio. And it uh, talks about chlorine should really be about 7% of your stabilizer level, that's a happy marriage. Um, if, if stabilizer runs too high, uh, then the chlorine will tend to combine with itself and form chloramines, chloramines combined chlorine, which is really not doing much to sanitize water. Um, so you want to maintain uh, a stabilizer level, chlorine level of about 7.5% of your stabilizer level. So if chlorine, if stabilizer is 50, chlorine at 3.5, stabilizer at 40, chlorine at 2.8, and you probably want your stabilizer level around 40, 45 parts per million, especially here in Florida, where we need to maintain a little bit higher chlorine levels between service visits because of the heat and the constant rains. Um, total dissolved solids for stain uh, lifting or for normal pool, uh, we want them below 1200 parts per million, just with the water's in balance, not even talking about stain lifting. But uh, obviously for a salt system, they're going to run higher because you've got you know, hundreds of pounds of salt in the water and that's gonna drive the TDS up. So we say that 4,500 on total dissolved solids is fine for a pool with a salt chlorine generator. Um, look, individual test results can be misleading. You need to look at the big picture. Uh, that's why you gotta test for all of these things and water is a balancing act. It literally is. Yep. So the following slides are gonna show you some examples of scale that are uh, scales that are basic visual representations of interaction between some of the standard parameters we test for in pool water. And these will give you an idea of what acceptable uh, water range is for what we're talking about with uh, balanced water. So here you have those key factors of alkalinity, calcium and pH. And you can see this is an example of a balanced pool uh, where we have a pretty normal range of uh, reading of alkalinity about uh, 110, 105, uh, calcium hardness, uh, probably somewhere about, uh, about 275 and a pH of 7.5. That's balanced water. Uh, but here you've got an example of water that is scale forming, uh, where the water is just full of too much and it's going to start depositing things out of solution, whether that's calcium. Um, and a lot of times it is because you'll get uh, a reaction that takes place in water where pH runs high along with warmer temperatures. You can actually form calcium carbonate in the water. Uh, don't ask me, Lauren, but it is, I've got it uh, saved onto some files. It's a complex chemical reaction where you can actually form calcium carbonate in water from high pH and oxygen uh, getting in the water, especially where you aerate water. Uh, if you have like a spillover between the spa and the pool, this is a lot of times why you'll get um, calcium deposits on the tile, the white streaking where the mm -hmm. spillovers are. So here you have alkalinity in a fairly normal range of around, you know, 105 again, and your, your, uh, calcium hardness is again at 275, but the pH is running a little higher at 7.6. And so that's a scale forming environment. pH weighs in pretty heavily in this equation. And here you have a normal pH, but low alkalinity low cal, you know, at 60 and your calcium level is barely at 165. And uh, so this is an example of hungry water or corrosive water where it's going to seek out metals and minerals from what it's coming in contact with, whether that be the heat exchanger in a gas heater and it's gonna try to draw copper out of there or the plaster in a, uh, a concrete swimming pool where it's gonna try to draw calcium out of the plaster. Maybe it's a fiberglass pool. Uh, a lot of times homeowners don't check for their calcium reading uh, in their fiberglass pools and rainwater, as we know, has a calcium reading of zero. And eventually the water starts going after the gel coat in the fiberglass pool because that's the finish. And you'll start to see black spots coming through the gel coat. And that's usually cobalt, which is uh, an accelerant they use in the fiberglass shell to help it cure. So you'll sometimes hear about these black spots in fiberglass pools that aren't black algae. And a lot of times it's due to corrosive water. And look, high chlorine levels can, uh, you know, chlorine's a great oxidizer and it will, it will do a number on metals and surfaces that it comes in contact with as well. So you need to keep that in mind that even though chlorine isn't there on the saturation index, that high chlorine levels can be damaging to pool surfaces and pool equipment because it is a strong oxidizer. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Water will independently do what it needs to do to try to find balance. So uh, we talked about this when pH and alkalinity are high, water can't rid itself of either of these on its own. So it's going to push out calcium until the point that it feels balanced again. So you'll get scaling, discoloration, other deposits, the white streaking that we see in the darker colored pools, um, the white on the tile line. If pH and alkalinity are low, water gets hungry. It can't get them on its own. So it's going to go after calcium from the finish, heaters, piping, until it feels balanced again. The outcome could be pitting on the surface, etching, and other deteriorations. Uh, we are going to skip over module six. So let me escape out of this. And some of this is a little repetitive, guys. So I just, that's why I'm not doing every module and in the interest of time. Okay, so module seven, uh, this is on stains and discoloration. Organic and inorganic stains and discoloration. So look, you know, green algae can be greenish tint to the water and or green deposits on the pool surface. Uh, this can be caused by rain, heat, low or no sanitizer level. Um, mustard algae can be brownish yellow, wispy. Um, I'm gonna give everybody just a chance to read through this so I'm not blabbing, but you can see black algae, pink slime. That's very contagious for pools. If you bring a piece of equipment into a pool with pink slime or pink algae and transfer it to another pool, you can, without sanitizing that equipment, you can bring pink algae into the next pool. White water mold, scum lines on the tile. It's usually a buildup of non-living organic matter like lotion, oil, soaps. <clears throat> Green algae. Um, how green algae causes discolored water. You know, a lot of times it's entering the air via algae spores, can attach itself to surfaces causing visible stains. They multiply, there are millions in the water by the time it becomes visible. So by the time you can see algae in the water, it's already a real problem. I get calls a lot from people that say, I'm going through a lot of chlorine in my pool. The pool doesn't look bad. You know, the water's pretty clear. And I'm like, look, you're fighting algae. Yeah, but I don't see any. Well, I'm like, look, by the time you see it, you don't want to get near that pool. You know, it's already a major problem. So and in Florida, where the water temperatures in the pools run over 90 degrees for several months mm -hmm. out of the year, it's very common to have this high chlorine consumption. And algae will thrive if, uh, if it's left unchecked. So mustard algae, uh, you know, it's a brownish yellow wispy algae, brushes off easily, but reappears very quickly and it multiplies quickly. We suggest using an EPA registered product. We have one, uh, it's called Yellow Stuff. It's sodium bromide. It's 99% sodium bromide. And, um, and you wanna put all the gear, nets, et cetera, in the pool when treating to eliminate this from reoccurring. Um, this is a, uh, bromine will cause an exchange between itself and chlorine, which help keeps, keeps them both active as sanitizers. Uh, again, this is a complex chemical occurrence with the exchange of ions. Uh, I have pages of it off the internet. I'm not going to get into it now because I don't remember it. I'm not a chemist, but I will tell you that adding some sodium bromide to a pool, so long as you're shocking the pool, you're not going to turn it into a, uh, into a bromine pool. Uh, but there is an exchange between sodium bromide and chlorine um, that causes them both to stay very active as sanitizers in the water. So if you're fighting mustard algae, it's a good idea to use this product. And there are a lot of products on the market that are not 99% sodium bromide. They're 88% or lower. There's some liquids that are under 50% sodium bromide and the rest is metals or garbage in it. So this is a pure product. Like everything we make at Jack's, it's top notch. Um, black algae, black algae spores can enter pools uh, via air contamination. Uh, they kind of take root, they penetrate plaster, um, the head has to be broken off by vigorous brushing, uh, a lot of times with a wire brush, and then algicide will penetrate and kill the black algae. Pink slime usually develops in remote places within the pool system, um, like shaded, moist areas inside the equipment, behind lights, ladders, uh, pool plumbing, automatic cleaners. Um, it doesn't thrive where direct sunlight is hitting it. It's common, I hear, out in like Northern California, where there's a lot of shaded, cooler, moist environments. Uh, by the time it becomes visible, it's, it's usually a problem. So, um, you know, there are ways to get rid of this stuff, usually superchlorination. 
is uh, shocking a pool, bring the chlorine level up to over 10 parts per million to between 10 and 30 parts per million uh, will normally help remedy these things, that circulation and a lot of brushing. White water mold, it's a whitish tissue-like substance, looks like shredded tissue paper, floats in the water. I don't run into it a whole lot, but every once in a while I get a call on this. Usually grows in the lines of the plumbing. Uh, by the time you see it, it's a real problem. It's not harmful, it's just kind of unsightly. It's, it's just a white mold. It can clog up the equipment. It's kind of slimy and uh, it'll deplete the oxidizer levels. So it can lock up your chlorine. Um, if you have a scum line on the tile, uh, you know, we've all been in the, the pool at the hotel that has the disgusting brown or black scum line on the tile from a hundred people being in the pool. Uh, you know, it's also known as bathtub ring. Uh, it's usually a buildup of oils, lotions, organic, uh, non-living organic contaminants in the water. Uh, you can remove it with a great cleaner like our Power Blue Jack's Magic Waterline Tile Cleaner. You spray it on with the tile dry. Within 20 or 30 seconds, you'll see that scum line drip right down, and you can just accelerate it with a wet brush. If you want to prevent it from happening, we make a great enzyme called Super Pack. It's a self-contained uh, powdered enzyme in a food-grade plastic baggie. Uh, they're one-ounce packs, and you throw them into a skimmer or a tank of a commercial pool. And uh, what these do is these off gas, all those non-living organic contaminants and uh, prevent the scum line from ever forming, really extends filter runs, uh, frees up your chlorine because remember this stuff is locking up the oxidizing potential of the chlorine and uh, mm -hmm. you'll go through a lot less chlorine in those pools. And these are great, these super packs, uh, not only because it's a self-contained powder in a bag, you don't have to measure it, but this stands up to 50 parts per million chlorine. A lot of enzymes start to break down at five parts per million chlorine. And look, when you're out servicing the pool, a lot of times you're adding chlorine to shock the pool mm -hmm. and you know, you're driving the chlorine level up to over five parts per million and you're deactivating that liquid enzyme that you're adding. So you don't risk doing that with super pack. We sell a lot of those in Florida, very popular in commercial pools. Common inorganic discolorations, uh, cloudy water uh, can be dull, hazy, murky in appearance and causes can be unbalanced water, poor circulation, poor filtration. Uh, green tinted water, if it's not algae related, related, a lot of times can be metals, copper, iron, uh, manganese, improper water balance. And brown tinted water, same thing, metals, copper, iron, manganese, non-algae related. So usually if the water is clear, very clear and colored, I say usually, um, then you're dealing with metals. If it's cloudy and colored, uh, a lot of times that's algae. And look, it can be both. So <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, while these are common inorganic discolorations, they can also sometimes be caused by organics too. We just talked about that. So cloudy water, uh, you know, can be from chemical imbalance, high pH, calcium hardness, total dissolved solids, uh, poor filtration, particles not being trapped by the filter. Uh, a lot of cloudy water simply due to poor filtration. Sand filters, you know, they're very forgiving. Um, filter fiber stuff is a natural edible cellulose fiber product that can be used to uh, supplement or uh, coat a sand bed or coat a cartridge element and literally turn it into a DE type filter where you're gonna filter down to one to two microns and can really help eliminate the cloudiness in the water. And the nice thing about that fiber stuff is it's safer for the pool tech that's handling it because it's all natural, correct? Yeah, this is, you know, DE is a carcinogen. It's like breathing in asbestos. Um, this is not, this is a natural edible uh, pulp fiber. It's food grade. Um, if you breathe it in, it's not harmful to the human body or the lungs. And if it got onto the ground, say somebody just, if they had a DE separator tank and they took that bag and they dumped that fiber on the ground, it wouldn't impact our environment like dumping the DE onto the ground does. Correct. It actually would feed, it feeds the, the ground. It feeds the earth. Dog sniffs it, doesn't hurt him, you know, if they have a dog outside. So general cloudiness, uh, look, there's a lot of different types of clarifiers on the market. Uh, but testing is the only way to know which one will work best for you. Uh, if you use a polymer-based clarifier, uh, overdosing can uh, cause clouding. Our clarifiers are non-polymer-based. 
Um, they're four by one clarifiers and they don't cloud the water. So our clarifiers uh, also act, they have a little bit of uh, sequestering agent in them, which helps get metals out of the water um, and a little bit of flocculant and also chelator. So that's why we say it's four by one. It's a clarifier. Uh, it's got phosphonic acid, uh, which will help take uh, iron and copper out of the water and other metals. Uh, it's a chelator, which helps put a shell around some of the metals in the pool as well. So they don't precipitate out and stain the pool. And uh, it's also a flock. So it'll, it can drop things to the bottom. If you add uh, six ounces of this per 10,000 gallons, run the pump for an hour and shut the pump off for 24 hours, our, sequest, our, a, uh, our clarifiers will act as a flocculant. Green tinted water could be improper water balance where you have higher low total alkalinity, uh, low calcium and high concentration of metals in the water. Brown tinted water could be tannins, leaves and other organic matter. And look, leaves and tannins can introduce, you know, algae into a pool. Um, tannins can be organic, but there also could be iron in those tannins or things that come out of the ground because you know, obviously the earth has metals in it, especially where there's fertilizer and plants pick these up, leaves pick these up and they can deposit those in the pool. The brown tinted water could also be water that's high in iron, copper or manganese. Uh, module eight, and this is on metal staining, specifically iron and the possible sources. So uh, you could have uh, heat exchangers, uh, typically uh, now with uh, most heaters, they don't have the uh, cast iron headers on the heaters, but some of the older ones did on the gas heaters back in the day. Um, brass gate valves, copper, galvanized plumbing, makeup water, uh, well water is obvious. It contain copper, iron, manganese, can be a source of high total dissolved solids. Uh, municipalities, sometimes they use metals and minerals to sanitize the water supply. I know here in North Tampa, uh, sometimes they fill a pool and the water looks black. There can be a lot of copper in the water. And of course you get phosphates in municipal water sources as well. Pool chemicals, lots of algicides are metal based, copper and silver that can add metals to the water. Uh, salt for chlorine generators and some chlorines, they contain trace amounts of iron. Muriatic acid does too. Uh, lawn chemicals, you have fertilizers, lawns, golf courses, ponds, lakes. We talked about this a little bit earlier. All these can contain metals. They may eventually end up in the pool and they have high phosphate levels. So, you know, when we have a pool that's stained and we're trying to figure out if we're going to get removal with an in-water treatment, we make a very inexpensive Jack's Magic stain identification kit. It can usually be picked up from your local wholesale distributor for under $10 if you're in the trade. And it's going to show you which product of any will help treat the specific stain in the pool. Uh, there are four very easy, quick tests that you may need to perform. A lot of times you get a hit with the first or second test. Uh, it's going to save you a lot of time and money because it shows it'll show you the next course of action. It, really the results you get from these 30 to 45 second spot tests will tell you if and how well an in-water treatment is going to work. So after you use the kit, you'll know exactly what treatment to move forward with. The test, the first test is for iron, cobalt, or where you have etching, spot etching, stains. The second test is gonna be for most forms of copper or scale or hydration, which can be trap moisture in a finish, typically a newer finish in a pool. The third test is for oxidized copper. And the fourth test is for iron scale, uh, where you have scale forming over iron, kind of like plaque over a stained tooth. Um, the following slides are gonna give you uh, a potential solution to lift these stains or scaling from the pool finish, but you still have to filter it out of the water. And so that's why we use sequestering agents. If you just use these powders to lift the stains, you know, you're lifting iron, you're lifting copper, you're, you're gonna circulate it back through the pump and filter system. I mean, if the filter system captured copper and iron really well, the pool wouldn't have stained in the first place, right? So this is why we use sequestering agents, these liquids that we have, Jack's Magic, pink, blue, purple, magenta, these cluster those metals and minerals that are floating in solution so the filter can capture them and remove them from the water. Um, so this is why it's important to use our procedures 
and our sequestering agents for the treatments that you're doing. So you only have to do it once. <laughs> Um, you don't want to shock for at least a week following a treatment because remember, chlorine is a strong oxidizer. It can flash those metals right back out of solution and restain the pool. And if we're rebalancing our pH and alkalinity, we want to do that with bicarb, which has a fairly neutral pH of around 7.7. .7. Uh, soda ash has a very high pH and uh, can spike things back out of the water. So you always want to use a stain ID kit. Don't guess at staining because the results you get doing the test will be the results you get doing the treatment. Uh, the causes of iron staining, you, know, you may have a pH and alkalinity increase. We talked about that, saturation index of water, uh, heavy oxidation going on, meaning a lot of chlorine in the water. Um, the saturation point has been reached and out comes the iron that's been floating around in the water. And we talked about the sources of water. It could be you know, municipal water, well water, fertilizer, chemicals we add to the pool, pesticides, pool equipment, okay? Iron characteristics, typically brown in color. However, so is iron scale, oxidized copper, some organic discolorations, tannic acid, tannins from algae. This is why we don't guess. Uh, a lot of chemicals we add to the pool have some iron in them. And usually it's aesthetic. Um, the finish has not been compromised and we can do a removal, but we wanna test it first to make sure. So there you have the iron stain underneath the planter where you got water probably when it rains running out of that planter where there's fertilizer and staining the pool with iron. So to remove iron stains, you know, this is where you use our iron and cobalt powder. If you've got a positive reaction when you did the stain ID test, the test number one uh, would indicate, you know, you, know, you have iron in the, in staining in the pool and you get great removal, then you wanna move on with the treatment. It's a non-acidic, non-toxic product. Um, it's not ascorbic or citric acid. It does not create chlorine demand. There's a lot of misconceptions on the market that this is citric acid or ascorbic acid, it is not. Um, the chlorine needs to be below one part per million to use it, but the good news is this powder lifts the iron stains in about 48 hours. So the results are very dramatic, as you can see where they did the testing on the step there on the floor of the pool in the vinyl pool in that picture in the upper right. Um, tea colored steps, you know, we see this in vinyl pools. Uh, we make a kit called Step Stuff for vinyl liner pools where, you know, iron carries a charge, the plastic steps carry a charge. So iron a lot of times will run to the step area in a vinyl pool and you can see the dramatic difference there before and after. Uh, it's an easy to use liquid and powder. The powder is the iron and cobalt and the liquid is uh, Jack's Magic Blue stuff, and it will lift that iron and sequester it out of the water. And we talked about where it can come from. Oh, this is iron scale, excuse me. This is where scale forms over iron. It can come from unbalanced water. It's kind of like plaque uh, over a stained tooth. So you have iron and then you have chemistry fluctuations causing scale. And now you've got kind of two problems in one. It's brown in color, it can look just like iron or algae or oxidized copper or di organic discolorations. And a straight iron removal won't work because you've got to get that scale lifted first. Does that make sense, Lauren? Yes. Okay, so that scale's got to be lifted up first because it's surrounding or covering it's the iron. It's covering and, it up, yeah. Yep, and it's it gonna up. feel rough, you know, it's gonna, because scale is a little bit rough. So removing iron scale, takes two products, our copper and scale product and our iron product. Uh, the instructions in the treatment will tell you that the heater's gotta be bypassed. Um, we don't recommend uh, uh, doing this uh, or swimming during a treatment because the pH and alkalinity are fairly low. This copper and scale product is acidic and you're adding acid to the water uh, when you're doing the treatment, when you start it. Um, spot etching, the stains are usually yellow, orange, brownish in color. Uh, they collect in the depression of the pitted etch etched area because metals are heavy. It'll feel a little bit rough because the finish is eroded in that area. We can remove the discoloration, but, but we, you know, we can't fix the etching with a stain treatment. That's going to be permanent. And if the water balance parameters aren't corrected, that finish could continue to etch away. So, you know, that usually happens either the finish is a hundred years old and, or the water is out of balance. It's aggressive water and it starts going after the plaster in the pool. 
So possible uh, sources of spot etching that you see here, you know, corrosive water, unbalanced water, maybe you have a trichlor uh, feeder, you know, chlorine feeder that's installed without a check valve. And when the pump shuts off, that water empties out of the chlorine feeder and you get a buildup of chlorine gas, which is very, very acidic. And then it bursts into the pool when the pump comes back on and that constant burst of chlorine gas in that area can cause pitting near the returns by the steps like you see there. Uh, chlorine floaters with little or no circulation, you know, the pH of uh, trichlor tabs is three. So if a chlorine floater, you know, gets stuck in a corner, you've got very acidic water just beating itself against that finish of the pool. Uh, chemical attack, if you had acid to your pool in the same spot every week, not a good idea. Muriatic acid is very aggressive. So module nine, uh, we're going to talk about copper specifically here, uh, a little bit more in depth, uh, possible causes, again, uh, unbalanced water, pH and total alkalinity going up, uh, heavy oxidation, you know, too much chlorine in the water, and the water's reached a saturation point on the saturation index. And if it's holding copper, out it will come, and it can stain the pool any color from pink to black. It can look like a tie-dye pretty, shirt. Pretty, huh? pretty. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was out on a pool in Gainesville about, I don't know, two years ago. And the pool was, it, it looked like a tie-dye shirt. It had every color in the spectrum. I'm like, wow, this is cool. And uh, the service tech was like, no, this is not yeah, what I'm owner. sure. I'm sure he didn't think it was cool. <laughs> no, they didn't want the pool looking like that. Um, a lot of times the blue and the green indicate the copper still in the, in the sulfate form with copper and sulfur combined. And you need to rust a layer of that copper first before it'll effectively remove. Well, lo and behold, we have a test for that in our kit. Um, the purple uh, that you sometimes see, the purple crystals in the, on the pool surface or on uh, the plastic fittings or on a rock waterfall, that usually indicates copper with a very high cyanuric level. It's called copper cyanuric or purple haze. And uh, look, hydration problems can also be gray or black. Um, the copper cyanuric issue can be uh, corrected by lowering the stabilizer level to under 70. I've also corrected it by actually adding sequestering agent and removing copper from the water and then it just goes away. You know, sometimes the stabilizer level is so high in the pool that the only way to get it to under 70 is to drain the whole pool. And that's not something a lot of homeowners want to do. So on a few pools, I've added a lot of our jacks uh, sequestering agent to get the copper out of the water. And if you brush those crystals into solution and you remove the copper from the water, uh, the cyanuric's got no copper to bind with. And then voila, the problem goes away. Copper can be a little more difficult than iron to remove, but it is usually aesthetic and can be uh, removed with an in-water treatment and the finish is not compromised. And there you go, there's some nice examples of copper staining. I like the blue in the upper right, but that's probably not what the homeowner wanted. Uh, there's the copper cyanuric, we talked about that. You can lower the stabilizer level. And if that's not feasible, you can add a lot of sequestering agent and lower and get rid of the copper in the water. Um, <clears throat> removing copper and scale product uh, that we make is called the copper and scale stuff. And you wanna make sure you get a positive ID with the second test, which is a little bit of this powder on a stained area. And this will treat a lot of forms of copper and also scale. It'll work on all types of pool finishes. Uh, the pH and alkalinity are gonna be low during this treatment. The instructions will tell you you have to bypass your heater. Uh, that does not mean turning the heater off. That means plumbing a bypass around the heater. Um, copper sometimes needs to be oxidized before it can be removed. Um, and so we have a little oxidizer uh, sample pack in the, in the ID kit. And also there's the picture of the product. If you're buying it in bulk to treat an entire pool, that O2 Safe Shock is a very strong oxidizer and it will rust a layer of copper when it's in the sulfate form and turn it to a reddish brown color. When you're doing the ID test and you'll go, oh my gosh, now I just turned the blue copper stain to this rusty color. I've ruined the pool. No, you haven't um, because the copper and scale product when applied on top of that will remove that rust. And then lo and behold, you know that you need to do an oxidized copper treatment. So it's in our book. It's the third treatment that corresponds with the third test. So the beauty of our program is when you do the tests, test number one for iron corresponds to treatment number one for iron, test number two for copper and scale corresponds to treatment number two for copper 
and scale and test number three for oxidized copper corresponds to treatment number three for oxidized copper. And this is a, a very high oxygen yielding product. It is not a persulfate compound, has a greater than 12% oxygen yield. Don't use chlorine free shock in place of this, please. It does not work nearly as well or at all. <clears throat> so there you have an example of the reddish brown color in the middle after we've applied the O2 safe shock to these blue gray copper stains, you get that reddish brown color and you can see then on the picture on the right that the copper and scale test washed it away. And so that would represent the oxidized copper treatment. So we are gonna go into module 10, which is other discolorations. Um, these are various other metals and minerals found in the pool, manganese, silver, and the causes you can see are basically the same as they were for the other staining. And we're not gonna spend too much time on this because I think that a lot of um, these ionization systems, at least here in Florida, they're not out there anymore. Maybe they are in other parts of the country. So that's why I left this in here, but silver staining, how pretty, uh, if they're using a silver algicide or they have a, an ionizer that's putting silver in the pool, uh, eventually those ions, you know, they come out of chelation and they can stain the pool. Chelators or chelated ions, usually they have a shell around them, kind of like a candy shell on an M&M that protects the metal or the chocolate in the M&M from melting out and staining the pool. But those ions do not stay in chelation forever. Sunlight, chlorine will burn them off and then the metals will come out and a lot of times stain the pool. Some other common issues you might see scale High pH and alkalinity can cause calcium and other metals to come out of solution, hit the pool surface. We talked about high pH and alkalinity. Uh, if they're uh, high enough, the water really can't get rid of them. So it has to deposit it out of solution. And pool water does not have to have a high calcium level to produce scale. We talked about that. If pH and alkalinity are high enough, it will produce scale calcium carbonate on its own. Pretty amazing. Mm. Oh, so I've, seen, get, I've seen this stuff. Used. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, groups on Facebook where I see the pool industry people talking about this product. Excuse me, I'm just drinking some water. Um, this is Jack's Magic Scale Off. This is a great product to treat scale on tile above the water line where you have the white calcium scale deposits. Um, there's no muriatic acid in this. So it's not going to etch through the grout line. It's not nasty to work with like muriatic acid. Um, you can actually, you know, put this on the surface of the pool uh, to remove some scaling. But I don't, you know, I don't recommend it to drain the pool to use this. This is really for above the water line. Um, and it's an acid-based product, but no muriatic in it. And it can remove that scale within about a minute of spraying it on tile with the tile dry. Uh, for undrained pools with below, you know, I'll just get back to this. Within 15 or 20 seconds of spraying this on, this sticks to the scale on the vertical tile surface, and you'll hear it sizzling. You'll see it foaming up in about 15 or 20 seconds. And then within about a minute, while it's still a little bit wet, just take a non abrasive brush and wet it and a little bit of vigorous brushing, and it'll cut through about two to four millimeters of scale at a time. This is one of our best selling products in Florida because everybody down here is on liquid chlorine, whether they're adding it manually or they have a salt chlorine generator and the pH of liquid chlorine is 13. So it produces calcium carbonate in the water and anywhere, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but anywhere water is aerated, uh, where you have a spillover between a spa and a pool or a water feature spraying water onto the tile, you tend to get the white calcium scale deposits. And this product is just incredible at removing those. Um, to remove scale for undrained pools uh, below the water line with scale, uh, you can uh, add magenta stuff and raise the water level uh, if you're trying to treat, you know, preventive maintenance. Uh, or if I should say that back in the day, if there was scale on the tile before we had scale off, we actually used to add magenta to the water and raise the water level to remove the scale from the tile. So magenta, the sequestering agent that you're looking at here, 
is a uh, very specific for calcium compounds. It's uh, it's our best selling product. It's used by a lot of guys that do startups, uh, plasters, builders, because you have calcium hydroxide coming out of uh, a fresh plastered pool. So this does a great job at removing those excess compounds so the pool doesn't scale up. And uh, part of the treatment when you're treating for scale with our copper and scale stuff, if you're treating for scale is you wanna use our Jack's Magic Magenta. And there are directions for that. Um, you know, you can call us, you can go online, the directions are there. Uh, this is a newer product about 15 years old and Magenta is a full spectrum sequestering agent. Uh, it has no phosphonic acid in it. So for those of you who are concerned about adding phosphates to the water, and look, the phosphates that are in our sequestering agents are, it's phosphonic acid, it's not orthophosphate, it's not algae food, um, but there are people who are uh, phosphobic, shall we say. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if you're phosphobic and you want to add a good sequestering agent um, to the water, this is a great one. It's a great ongoing maintenance product because it does address the little bits of iron and copper that incrementally get in the water through the addition of pool chemicals and whatnot. Um, and it also does a great job at inhibiting scaling, which is a very common issue in pools because of climbing pH. Uh, hydration characteristics. This is usually black or gray in color, sometimes brown. It's usually completely aesthetic and the finish isn't compromised if it's left untreated. Um, a lot of times you have to do uh, an alternative treatment that that means a drain, a drain and acid wash it's not something we recommend at jack's magic but where the finish needs to be re-exposed to uh, dry it out um, what hydration uh, a hydration problem means is that the plaster did not cure evenly it stayed wet in certain certain areas like wet paint on a wall not drying like the rest of the wall and so while most of the wall looks white there are certain areas that continue to look dark and that would be uh, comparable to what happens in a swimming pool when you have a hydration issue with the plaster. Uh, you can do a low alkalinity treatment in the water, try an in-water treatment first, and we have a way of doing that. So contact us. The possible sources of this trap moisture, uneven drying, we talked about that, uh, heavily shaded areas versus the sunlight. Sometimes if you know there's pool, uh, areas in the pool that have get a lot of shade, versus they get a lot of sun, the plaster won't cure as evenly as it should. Uh, unbalanced water and a lack and or a lack of brushing during the startup where you have scale possibly settling in certain areas of the pool, a lot of times around the main drain because it's heavy. And then water, which is supposed to help cure the plaster, can't get through that scale to do so. And so the plaster stays dark looking in that area, whereas in other areas of the pool where the pool water is contacting the plaster and curing it, it starts to dry out. So sometimes you won't, a lot of times you won't see this hydration problem, this unevenness in curing for six, eight months down the road because plaster is curing for one year after water's put in the pool. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And a lot of times in a lighter colored finish where you don't see the, the white lighter colored scale settle to the floor of the pool, you won't see that shady area for six or eight months because the rest of the pool is slowly drying. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, so sometimes it's just varied thickness of application of the plaster where if it's thinner rather than thicker in certain areas, it's gonna dry at a different rate and look different. Uh, sometimes the moisture content in the shell, uh, green areas in the shell prep that stayed wet. Uh, if it's a remodel, maybe not using bond coat or different applications of the bond coat underneath before applying uh, the new plaster. So usually when it's on the wall, it's not uh, a, a, new, a new pool. Uh, it's usually, this is where you'd have a remodel problem because scale is heavy and it will settle to the floor of the pool. Um, that picture on the right is more classic of the new construction um, where you have a scale, a scale problem uh, where it is on the left, yes, it's a hydration problem, but it's not typically from scale. That's usually going to represent, I can tell it's a remodel usually because um, you'll have different thicknesses and application of the new plaster or what's behind the plaster. So 
Uh, zero alkalinity, acid treatment, uh, low alkalinity hydration treatment. Uh, you can do this in water. People call it a low alka, zero alk treatment. Uh, so this is one way to uh, hopefully cure the problem without draining and acid washing. But you have to add enough acid to make the water very, very aggressive. Uh, what you're trying to do is really open up the finish and release the trap moisture so the, the plaster can continue to cure and look like the rest of the pool that has cured. Uh, it's very aggressive. Uh, it'll dissolve scale and treat staining without draining the pool. It has to be monitored daily and water tests need to be taken daily. Uh, you cannot take this process lightly. You can damage the surface of the pool. Please contact us before starting this procedure and we will walk you through it. This is no longer than a five day process and you have to be there every day to monitor the chemistry levels. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, liner mold in vinyl liner pools. Sometimes you can have a fungus that grows under the pool. Uh, it'll shadow through the liner. It'll appear as a surface stain. It can be gray, black, or brown in color. It doesn't penetrate the seams of the liner, but you may see like a clean stripe growing through the middle of the discoloration. And it's, if, it's, uh, if the discoloration is a surface topical stain, uh, chlorine will make it worse or have no effect. Instead, use a high pH chlorine or calcium hypochlorite. So the reason we do this is CalHypo has a pH of 10.6. Um, and if you test that area with CalHypo and it lifts or fades it, you know that it's not metal. Uh, trichlor tab, if we're reading on here, uh, low pH acidic chlorine like trichlor will react and make the stain go away, whether it's a surface stain like a metal or mold from underneath the liner. Um, a surface stain being metal will usually lift with an acidic product like trichlor. This is why the great separator in staining, if you want to figure out if the stain in a pool, whether it's a vinyl liner pool or even a plaster pool that has a brown green stain, and you're saying, hey, this could be algae. Um, I'm not sure, even though if it doesn't brush away, it still could be algae. I had a pool stained uh, like these uh, brown green stains around the main drains for four years. <laughs> and uh, wow. the service company, yeah, the service company maintenancing the pool uh, said, well, someone just bought the house. They've retained me as the service company. They want to get rid of these stains. I've been brushing it. It doesn't go away. So I told him, I said, all right, get the water ready. He had never used the ID kit. So I met him out there. And the water was balanced when I got there and we did the ID test for metals and got no reaction with any of the tests. And he goes, wow. I said, yeah, you know, I'm surprised. Normally we get a real good reaction, especially when the water's balanced like this, the way it should be. So um, I went to the car and I got some Cal Hypo and I put it in a sock, uh, a skimmer sock, and I dropped it down to the bottom of the pool and pff, big brown green cloud comes up and it was, it was algae. So it had been there four years and he had tried brushing it away. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that chlorine will react with mold too. If it's, if it's liner mold. Um, so uh, it'll, it'll, it'll make it vanish, but it'll come back. So that's how, you know, you have mold behind the liner in a vinyl liner pool. And look, you don't want to hold that Cal hypo there very long. It is bleach. <laughs> so you can bleach the liner. It's just a, a test for a few seconds. Um, it will not, uh, CalHypo will not react with a metal or mineral stain, but a low pH chlorine like a trichlor tab will. So people that test a stain with a trichlor tab, they say, hey, I got rid of it. Look at the circle in the bottom of my pool. I'm like, that's great. We don't know if it was algae because the chlorine will kill the algae. And we don't, know, we don't know if it was metal because the very low pH of that trichlor tab could have lifted the metal. So wonderful for you. I'm glad you got rid of the stain, but if it's metal, it's probably going to come back. So um, look, if you want to keep liner mold from coming back, just keep your chlorine levels a little bit higher um, and the discoloration will, uh, it, it can reappear when the chlorine levels return to normal range. So it's kind of unfortunate. It's not much you can do about it uh, other than removing the liner and treating the mold underneath the liner. So that's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a pain in the neck. Module 11, we are also gonna do this one. We have three more uh, modules. So this is on stain treatments options. Um, you know, there's chemical 
versus acid wash. So the chemical removal, which is our process, is uh, the chemistry does need to be altered for the stain removal. Uh, with an acid wash, the pool needs to be completely drained, pain in the neck. Uh, chemical removal, you have the cost of the chemicals. Acid wash, cost of refilling and rebalancing the water. Um, the treatment time with a chemical removal is one day to two weeks. Acid wash is very quick, but here are the negatives on an acid wash. You know, it's hard work. Um, although it is a short downtime, it's very hard work. Uh, the chemical removal is much labor, much less labor intensive, much less damaging to the finish. Um, with an acid wash, the finish has direct contact with muriatic acid. So that's a very, very aggressive way of doing a stain removal. Um, and with a chemical removal, the level of stain removal uh, can vary. With an acid wash, it's directly removed, but what damage have you done to the surface of the pool? And typically with our treatments, if they're done right, um, and you do the test first, if you do the ID kit and you get 90 to 100% removal of that stain, uh, that means you're gonna get 90 to 100% of removal of the stains throughout the pool when you do a treatment. So that last point there with chemical removal of the level of stain removal can vary. It really will mirror the result you got doing the uh, stain identification kit, which is a, you know that very inexpensive under $10 from the wholesaler kit that we recommend people using. So sometimes you could just spot treat an area without using acid uh, like this, um, iron stain below the planter, you know, they can use our iron and cobalt product to spot treat and lift that. But I would also use a sequestering agent at the same time um, because you're lifting iron into solution and you wanna make sure that it's clustered and removed from the water with a sequestering agent, otherwise it will come back. In this case, it makes more sense to treat the entire pool because the whole pool is stained. We talked about how aggressive acid washing is. Um, you know, you want to dilute it before you do an acid wash. Usually a 50-50 dilution with water is what they'll use. And it's really in a plaster pool, it's removing a thin layer of plaster. And sometimes it's the only resort for a treatment. Um, the next module is going to be on uh, preventive maintenance, being proactive versus reactive. And this is really the best way to keep the pool free from stains and discoloration. Uh, you want to be proactive versus reactive. You know, we're taught from the time we're young to brush our teeth, uh, but not every homeowner, pool owner is taught from the time they have their pool to be proactive against uh, staining prevention. So preventive maintenance, you know, of course, using an accurate test kit really helps maintaining proper water balance, testing the water weekly or more often uh, here in Florida where we have major weather events, you know, every few days in the summer. Sometimes the water should be tested more than once a week. Um, brush the pool weekly, brush the floor, the walls, the steps. Um, be sure the brush is appropriate for the pool finish. And brushing can really help uh, reduce the buildup of algae scale and scum lines. Look, every decision you make relies on properly tested water. So you know, have a reliable test kit. We make one uh, where the reagents are tablet reagents. They're shrink wrapped. Um, Digital test kits, photometer test kits are the most accurate, precise options on the market, along with ours, because our tablets don't degrade. Uh, they are shrink wrapped. They're not liquid reagents in porous bottles. But regardless of your choice, make sure you know its limitations, the test kit's limitations, and you have to account for these when you test the water. So preventive maintenance, you know, make sure uh, that the pool filter is clean, operating according to the manufacturer's guidelines, backwash or clean it habitually. Um, you, we suggest using filter fiber stuff or an enzyme uh, and an enzyme really to break down contaminants, makes it a whole lot easier on the filter to remove items from the water. Uh, vacuum the pool regularly, whether it's manually vacuumed or has an automatic cleaner. Uh, the more often you do this, the better. Filter maintenance. You know, backwashing a pool, uh, pool filter removes metals and debris to allow the filter to get back to work. If you're using a sequestering agent, you know, you're going to have some metals and other things in the filter um, that will collect. So that's why it needs to be backwashed. Uh, to clean a cartridge filter uh, or a DE filter, we really recommend Power Blue cartridge and DE filter cleaner. So rather than just rinse off the cartridge element or backwash the DE filter, uh, you know, every few months or so, um, you should do a thorough cleaning 
and that means spraying off the cartridge element uh, with a high pressure hose or spraying off the grid assembly, taking it out of the filter after you backwash it and spray it off with a high pressure hose, spraying on this power blue cartridge and DE cleaner. And five minutes later, high pressure hose it off and you're done. It's that quick, it's not an overnight soaking. Um, so it restores the element or the grid assembly to like new condition, flushes out all that organic non-living contaminants that build up uh, on the fabric and uh, really restores the filter to like new condition and gets you back to nice, good, clean startup pressure and extends the filter cycles again. If you have a sand filter that's, yeah, what's that Lauren? Nice. Yep. If you have a sand filter that's clogged, you pour this product in through the skimmer. It's a great backwash cleaner and uh, gets a lot of those uh, organic contaminants out of the sand bed and restores it to like new condition. So uh, filter maintenance, you know, you want to consider using a cellulose fiber product um, like filter fiber to lower the microns for better filtration of contaminants, especially for sand and cartridge filters, which are more forgiving than a diatomaceous earth filter. This can also be used as a DE substitute. Seven ounces of filter fiber equals one pound of DE. Um, it will tell you that right on the bag. Three ounces of filter fiber stuff can be added to a cartridge system per 25 square feet of cartridge filtration. It's on the bag. So if you have a 100 square foot cartridge filter, 12 ounces of filter fiber stuff can be added to that system. It'll coat the cartridge element and turn it into a DE filter. You should always pre-dilute this in a bucket of pool water first before adding it through the skimmer. You don't want it to clump up on the cartridge element or the sand bed or the uh, grid assembly of the DE filter. And for a sand filter, just two or three ounces of this through the skimmer, um, of course, with the pump running and it'll coat the sand bed. And you know, with sand filters, you can have perfectly balanced, beautiful water and then you turn the light on at night and you see that little bit of haze around the light and it's just particulate that a sand filter will not filter out of the water, but you add this filter fiber stuff to that sand bed and lo and behold, you'll be able to see through that light beautifully without any haze. It's a big, big difference. And well, enzyme it, product, go ahead. This, this stuff can be added as well to a commercial uh, vacuum DE filter as well. You just oh, yeah. measure, you by the cup, measure it by the cup, dump it in the tank, go through your pre-coat cycle like you normally would. Yep, I have commercial service companies that buy this in 22 and 44 pound bags. One is right over there in Stewart, uh, Florida over in uh, Jensen Beach. So they buy in big 44 pound bags because they, they you know, first of all, first of all, it filters better than DE. You're going down to one to two microns and it's not a carcinogen. So for their techs that work with it or where they have to discharge it, they don't have to, it, it feeds the environment. So they don't have to worry about where they're discharging it and who's working with it, which is great. And then you have our enzyme, we talked about it earlier, but it's gonna off gas all the oil, lotion, other organic non-living contaminants that really clog up filters and lock up chlorine. So it's a great item for a heavily used pool. Preventive maintenance, more about this, you know, leaf net regularly, collecting leaves so you don't get the tannin stains, the algae, uh, remove debris, uh, removing debris reduces chemical consumption, obviously. Uh, you don't know, you don't want to allow the floating debris to stick to the pool surface. We talked about scum lines and staining. Uh, clean the pool skimmer out. You know these are pretty obvious things, but skimmer baskets collect leaves, grass clippings, bugs, <laughs> other floating debris that's been collected in the basket. Uh, cleaning, keeping that clean will really help circulation and filtration of the water. So we make a product called Surface Magic. This is one of our most uh, popular, best-selling products. And you can skim a pool manually without this, but this makes it a whole lot easier. And um, this is an isosurfactant that basically pushes everything away from itself to the other side of the pool. So you don't have to chase all the surface debris around with your net. It will cut down skim time in the average residential pool by about 10 minutes. It takes about five minutes to work. So it should be added when you get to the job. If you're a service technician, just hop out of the truck, walk up to the equipment, turn off the pump, walk up to the pool, and just pick one spot, usually the middle of the pool or the midpoint, I should say, you know, between the shallow and deep end, that midpoint of the pool, but add the drops right at the edge where the tile hits the water. It'll tell you on the bottle to add two drops per 100 square foot of surface area. So if you have a 12 by 24 pool, which is 288 square feet, 
you want to add about five to six drops. It's better to underdose this product. And again, add it at the midpoint of the pool, but add it at the edge where the tile hits the water. Unless it's a real windy day, like the wind's coming from the shallow end, then add the drops at the shallow end and then go, you know, go back to the truck, get the pole, the net, do the water chemistry, clean the filter. And five minutes later, everything is going to be pushed to the other side of the pool on a screen pool, the pollen, the gnats, the little, the, the little things that you chase around forever on an open pool, leaves, grass clippings, pine needles. It's really incredible. There's no soap in it. Back in the day, guys would use, you know, a few drops of Dawn soap to uh, coagulate all the surface debris. You know, it's not the greatest. I mean, it puts a rainbow on the surface of the pool and suds in the filter. Uh, this does not do that. This is a very unique product. Um, sequestering versus chelating for preventive maintenance. We talked about uh, how sequestering clumps the metals and minerals together to make them filterable <laughs> so the filter can take them out of the water. Uh, chelating agents put a shell around the metals and minerals. Uh, you'd want to use a chelating agent if you have like a mineral system, uh, an ionizer, that you don't want to remove the metals that are helping uh, sanitize the pool water. But eventually chelates are broken down by sunlight and chlorine, and then the metals and minerals can stain the pool. So um, you want to use a good chelating agent. We have one called ionizer stuff. Uh, sequestering agents and chelating agents help filter metals to prevent staining from occurring and they're much less expensive than removing the stains later. So this is why being proactive versus reactive is a good idea. Uh, match the sequestrant to the known issues with the fill water in anticipation of potential problems, you know, especially if you're filling a pool with well water or maybe the homeowner has the old cast iron plumbing going to the home. You know, you may have quite a bit of iron going into the water or if it's an area where there's high calcium. I know down in like Northport, um, they fill pools with well water and the calcium reading out of the well, out of the well is over 600. Uh, this can be an issue. Uh, any product is better than no product because prevention is easier than removal. So if you're not sure which sequestrant to use and you can't reach us, I don't know why you couldn't, but if you can't, you know, putting one of our sequestering agents in the water because they are all full spectrum sequestering agents is better than not adding anything at all. Um, there are a wide variety of different formulations on the market. Some are better formulated than others. And ours, I firmly believe are the best. I carry the chemistry sheets on the others and the chemistry differences are striking in both the strength and the pH of the products. Um, we're gonna explain the difference between uh, our products here. We're a pink stuff. This is Jack's first product over 30 years ago. Uh, is very specific for iron. And a few years later, Jack came out with the blue stuff, which also does iron just as well as pink stuff, but handles copper a whole lot better. So this is really good for uh, pools with known iron and copper issues. It's very chlorine tolerant. And uh, this is what we include with the vinyl liner uh, blue stuff kit or the uh, vinyl kit that we were talking about earlier. And uh, this is very good for taking the metal finer, uh, iron or copper out of the water. And a lot of times in vinyl pool, it is iron that goes to the steps. So the third and fourth sequestering agents were next evolution. Uh, back in the mid nineties, when salt chlorine generators took the market by storm, we came out with the purple stuff, which basically is blue stuff, but it works a whole lot better in high TDS environment where you have, you know, hundreds of pounds of salt in the swimming pool, which take the TDS well up over 1200, usually in the 4,000 to 4,500 parts per million range. So, um, and again, these can be used during stain removals and also uh, for startups with known high TDS issues and for preventive maintenance. And then the next product, which we came out with about 15 years ago is magenta stuff. And this is for pools that really don't have a known iron or copper issue, a heavy iron or copper issue when filling it, um, but it's a plaster finish and you wanna get that calcium hydroxide out of the water. This is our number one seller uh, by far. And this really does a great job of getting the plaster dust out of the water um, so the pool doesn't scale up. And so the pool cures evenly. We talked about that earlier. 
um, that if these calcium compounds like calcium hydroxide, plaster dust are not removed on startup, a lot of times that stuff will settle to the floor of the pool, usually in the deepest parts of the pool, and you'll get inconsistent curing in the finish or a hydration issue. And for uh, removal of staining or scaling, this is also recommended. So if you're doing a scale treatment where somebody has a what was once a darker colored pool and it now looks all grayed out and has white patches possibly on the finish, that's usually a scaled pool. And this along with our copper and scale powder will do a great job in uh, removing that those calcium compounds out of the water. We have a chelating agent, uh, the ionizer stuff, and um, it's not a uh, traditional sequestering agent because they're using an ionizer like a Nature 2, a frog system, a Pool RX uh, to help sanitize the water where they can keep a lower chlorine level, but they're using metals to help sanitize the water. Um, we don't wanna remove uh, those metals uh, with a sequestering agent. We wanna use a chelating agent to keep those metals in the water, but put a little protective shell over them so they don't uh, precipitate out and stain the pool. So that's the difference between a chelating agent, which is our ionizer stuff, and a sequestering agent, which is like our pink, blue, purple, or magenta. Those remove the metals and minerals from the water. Ionizer stuff does not remove them because if you had an ionizer, you wouldn't want to remove them, right? You're trying to use those metals and minerals to sanitize the water. So this just puts a shell around them. And a lot of these ionization systems use or they make chelated uh, ions that go into the water. The problem is they don't stay in chelation forever. So the directions on this bottle will tell you that four ounces of ionizer stuff per 10,000 gallons weekly added to the pool water will really, really help keep those metals and minerals in chelation. I mean, eventually you're gonna build up so many metals and minerals in the water that the pool is probably going to stain at some point, but it can delay it for years and years and years and years. Whereas it would happen a whole lot quicker if you didn't use this. So the last module is on startups. And this is really crucial for uh, getting the pool off on the right foot from the get go. And you wanna follow, of course, the manufacturer's recommendations for startup guidelines, uh, individual finishes, for example, brush daily or wait to add salt until day 28, uh, test the water, adjust it accordingly. And we recommend using National Plaster Council's startup card for all pool types um, and a sequestering agent during the startup process. And we have National Plaster Council guidelines printed uh, and we've included in there using our sequestering agents to help get these metals and minerals and calcium hydroxide if it's plaster out of the water so the finish cures properly. Um, choose which one is best for the startup, test the fill water, and then use the chart on the following slide as a guide. So we're gonna get into that here in a second. And if it's a real problem water area, I mean, I get calls from people saying, hey, I just, I just filled a pool with well water and it's dark brown. <laughs> that indicates a pretty heavy iron problem, typically here in Florida. So rather than put you know, one quart of blue stuff in, I'll have them put two quarts of blue stuff in per 10,000 gallons. And if it's plaster, I'll also have them put in magenta stuff to get rid of that plaster dust out of the water. And you can see here on the chart, magentas, I always recommend it for plaster pools and uh, for fill water with high calcium issues. Uh, purple stuff, you know, typically we're not adding salt for 28 days, so it's not usually uh, a startup product. And look, the reason we don't add salt for 28 days is twofold. Um, it really drives up the total dissolved solids in the water. So if there are metal or mineral issues in the water, it can really uh, quicken the time where the pool is gonna stain. So you wanna wait those 28 days to address those metal and mineral issues with a good sequestering agent first before adding your salt, but also salt acts as a softener and uh, can draw calcium out of the plaster. So that's another reason we don't wanna add salt for 20, the first 28 days. Blue stuff is the more commonly used startup product where there's known issues, known metal issues like iron and copper with the fill water because remember purple is for pools that have already gotten salt in it 
and blue would be for pools that haven't. And typically we're not putting salt in for at least the first 28 days. So you can see here what we've explained, uh, no known fill issues, or if it's plaster, I always recommend magenta. Um, if it's a fiberglass pool, you don't need magenta because there's no plaster dust. So that's where you want to use blue to remove metals and minerals. Uh, plaster pool with a high TDS, use magenta and purple. Uh, plus, or salt pool, fill water with known metal issues, purple and blue would be probably the best idea there. So to review, uh, metal, mineral stains, discoloration, uh, the method could be an acid wash or a chemical removal, uh, but you know you can get possible finish deterioration with an acid wash for sure. Uh, not usually with our chemical removal, but there are others on the market that can cause finish, finish deterioration. Ours is a very non-aggressive approach. Um, the problem of, of organic stains, discoloration, uh, usually heavy chlorination, shock, or various algicides, and the consequence usually is a crystal clear pool. So no bad consequence there. Uh, if your problem is cloudy water, you know, increasing the filtration, using clarifiers, flocks, uh, dropping the pH a little bit, uh, usually will have very good results. Uh, discolored water from metals, you know, increase your filtration time, your runtime on the filter and pump, and uh, adding a sequestering agent will get those metals out of the water. That's usually a lot of times where the water is discolored and clear. Uh, if it's discolored and cloudy, a lot of times that represents algae. So again, run the pump and filter uh, a little bit more. You know, anybody that calls me with these known types of issues, I always tell them, run the pump on high speed until the problem subsides because not circulating the chemicals that you're adding to the pool just really does nothing. We talked about that earlier, that circulation is kind of like the heartbeat of the system. So if you're adding chemicals to the water and expecting a result by not running the pump, that's a pretty big mistake. So to run the pump on high speed for a few days or a week to get the problem to subside, yeah, it costs a little bit in electricity, but the homeowner will forget about that uh, in a heartbeat uh, when their pool water is crystal clear, okay? If it's not crystal clear in a few days, you're going to have a bigger problem with the homeowner than a little bit higher money on their electric bill at the end of the month. So uh, pink slime, and we talked about shocking agents, algicides, good results, whitewater mold, same thing. Liner mold, not much you can do. <laughs> no remedy. Unfortunately, you can test it with uh, Cal Hypo. And if it removes on your vinyl liner and comes back, you probably have a mold problem underneath the liner. And there's really not much you can do other than treat the mold under the liner. And a lot of times that is just not feasible most of the time, unless it's an above ground pool and you're deciding to put a new one in, then you can treat the mold and put your new liner in or in ground vinyl liner pool and it's time to change the liner, that would be a good time to address mold coming from underneath the liner. Uh, tannins, um, a lot of times uh, granular chlorine like Cal Hypo can address that, uh, but you have to watch for bleaching the surface with Cal Hypo, you can't hold it there too long. And sometimes Cal Hypo does not address all tannins. Sometimes those tannins uh, can have metals in them. And that's where you'd want to get into using our ID kit. So um, I want to thank everybody uh, for attending this. Uh, it's definitely my pleasure to be able to present this to you. And again, I'll give you the phone numbers or the uh, yeah, our phone numbers for Jack's Magic 727 536 4500. Uh, we also have a toll-free number. And again, that number was 727-536-4500. And we have a toll-free number at 800-348-1656. That's 800-348-1656. We are a, uh, a family-owned business. We've been here in uh, Pinellas County, Florida for over 30 years. We are very hyper-focused on what we do. We're the best at it in the industry. This is all that we do is what you got here today. So um, we may not be the least expensive option, but we are the best option. You will hear from people that have been using Jack's Magic for years that may have tried something else. And they always say that nothing works like Jack's Magic. And if you know Jack, uh, you won't have any stains in the pool. And um, 
you know, we hope to keep you as our customer. If you are already one, I uh, hope that you learned something today. And if you're not our customer, uh, I encourage you to call us. Um, the person who answers the phone will get you connected with your local Jack's Magic rep. We have in-house reps all over the country, as well as rep agencies that we work with. Uh, I handle a good part of Florida, uh, along with another gentleman whose name is Scott. Um, so the two of us uh, can always help you here in Florida. Um, but, you know, call the phone numbers I gave you and you'll be directed to one of us. And we're glad to uh, glad to help you. Well, thank you very much today. That was such a wealth of information, Joel. Thank you for doing that presentation for the audience. Um, there have been people watching on Facebook Live. Um, we don't have anybody in the Zoom room, but I know it's during a time where pool companies are out there and they're busy and a lot of them are up north starting to get their places ready to open. If not, they very open because they're trying to open earlier this year after previous uh, year uh, being closed. So um, again, this will be, um, it will be on as a recording on the Facebook page for Space Coast Pool School. You should be able to watch it there. And I will also have the recording from the Zoom room uh, posted within a week or so um, to all the social media platforms. So if you weren't able to catch it here, you'll be able to catch it on social media, look at it in one of the Facebook groups or Instagram, find the link, go to it. It'll be up on my YouTube channel. That's where the link will take you. And if you have questions afterwards, do you have an email address, Joel, that they can email you if they have any questions after they've watched the recorded presentation? Yeah, absolutely. You can email me at Joel, J-O-E-L, at Jack's Magic. That's one word, no apostrophe, J-A-C-K-S-M-A-G-I-C.com, Joel at jacksmagic.com. So if you have any questions and you've watched the recorded training at some point, even if it's two weeks from now, a month from now, whenever you get around to it, please reach out to Joel at any specific questions you may have. He's very knowledgeable and that's why I asked him to be on today. He's the expert in this area. So definitely reach out to him. Um, but thank you for being on Facebook Live today and listening to our training if you were listening to it live, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren.